Thank you all for coming. Um, and I think as most of you know, this is a tremendously important topic that we're talking about tonight, not only for Greece, but for really the world, because Greece is just uh, a few steps ahead of the rest of us in terms of facing um, the, the uh, strict uh, uh, enforcement of austerity measures uh, against ordinary people. And as most of you know from reading the paper, uh, Greek society is in a, a very severe crisis now, in which I think there really is going to be probably a fork in the road of which way are they going to go in response to this crisis. Um, the format of the meeting is as Tom described, so please don't feel like when it comes to the discussion you have to make a phony question up. You know, you can make a real comment if you, if you want to, even without, without a question. Um, and I, I think this will be a really um, interesting discussion. I plan to be fairly strict with the speakers as far as their time is concerned, so that we do have a chance to have discussion and they'll be able to comment during that time as well. So uh, we'll begin with Alex. Okay. <coughs> If they can hear you, you can oh. sit down. Hmm? Better if you stand up. And you have a microphone. <coughs> well, well, no, it's not working. Right. It's the Sorry. projection. Yeah, no problem. It's the projection. Hmm? It's the microphone. Okay, yeah, no problem. Sorry. <coughs> so I have to speak here, huh? You know that you're, okay. So thank you very much. Uh, hello to everybody, first of all. It's very, it's very challenging meeting for me. I mean, it's a very, the first time I'm here in this city, actually, and it's the first time also to be in a, a, such a gathering, which I gather it uh, would be quite interesting and very promising for the future of our international movement, I hope. Uh, secondly, I want to notice that uh, uh, the, the connection of which drove me to be here with you tonight is PNHP, the, the Physicians for a National Health Program. Because I am connected to that, I'm a physician also, as you heard. So I have a good friends here from, from, from PNHP. And as they knew that I'm going to go to their meeting in uh, San Francisco, here I am. So this is a good, uh, I think, example to, to show that all different movements, grassroots movements that are around, uh, specialized with specific topics or not, Anyway, we are gathered together in order to, you know, start forming an international movement uh, against the brutality that it is promised by our governments all over the world. So, uh, I w as I've been told that pr probably you know more or less the situation in Greece, and in terms of economy, I'm not going to, to, to you know, to bother you with a, a lot of details. I'm going just to show you what is happening today and what are the responses by the movement and I think it's very important to discuss that. I mean, how we respond to that and what the responsibilities of the uh, future to come. So Greece is uh, in, in the turmoil of the crisis, as you know, it is not only an economic crisis, it's political, ideological and social crisis also. Uh, which of course uh, was not uh, just, uh, did not came just suddenly in a day, but it is a, a product of a continuity of uh, the policies that were implemented uh, a lot of years before, not only in Europe, but in the world, which we call them, which are very well known as the neoliberal policies. So one point that we have to keep in mind is that the, these neoliberal policies were implemented in Greece by mainly the two big parties, which are the conservatives and the socialists. And it's important to know that the socialists were even better to deliver the job for the neoliberal policies than the conservatives. I mean, and it's very important to understand the nowadays crisis of the political system. Secondly, uh, and as it is obviously also an international phenomenon, the neoliberal ideology and policies also are, uh, I think, combined with what we called uh, scandals and corruption. So these guys, these, these two political uh, bodies, are full of corruption in all that years, these years. And I just want to mention, regard, I mean, in order to understand the, the Greek situation, Greece, you know, it's a very small country. On the other side, 
we had the Olympics, so the Olympic Games are a very important point in terms of spending without having, you know. So we, we, the, the government organized this, uh, all this uh, feast of Olympic Games, which is a feast for Coca-Cola mainly, but not for the population, of course. Uh, and this was a big, uh, it, it gave a big amount of debt to the Greek uh, government and state. And the other uh, issue which also is important is that you have to know that Greece is one of the bigger clients of not only the American, but mainly the American uh, weapons industry. Greece and Turkey, you know, are competing between them in order to, to be who is the best client of the uh, uh, international weapons industry. So this also is producing a big debt. So we are arriving to the, 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 the recent crisis where uh, suddenly it is realized that Greece is a, in a debt, the, in a, the, the, the GDP and so on and so on, all that stuff. I'm not going to speak at all on these. I think they are well covered all over the world and we know that those. Anyway, the, and that means that Greece has to, to resolve the problem. And here is the, the help which is coming under the figure of IMF, the European Central Bank and the European Union, which are imposing to Greece, to the go Greece government, if, if, because you have to pass to overthrow this debt crisis, you have to have these specific policies, which are just the continuation, not only the continuation of uh, the neoliberal policies, but these are much more uh, uh, cruel to the Greek population. So the idea is that uh, under the very well-known uh, agenda of IMF, actually, which was is used the last 40 years all over the world, mainly we have a lot of experience from Africa, we have a lot of experience from Latin American countries, and today, it's Europe. It's, the, it's, the, it's the, the time to have the same policies in Europe. So IMF means austerity, means, means constatement, means that we have to erase the public space, which means all the public services and so on, from uh, the dictionary. So we have to erase and to diminish up to erase the, the public sector and uh, give the opportunity to the, the good investors to invest in all the public services and all the public, uh, uh, up to now, public owned uh, wealth also. Okay? So this is what is happening in Greece, actually. So we have a government that was and still is the, the same people, and this is very interesting historically also, but it's very interesting to, to see that because we know the guys. Okay? So the same people that, that spent all this money to the weapons, to Olympic to the Olympic Games and to their corruption for their own families. So the same guys are coming today and tell, is, are telling us that, look, you are in a crisis. We have to make economy because, uh, you know, we spend a lot. So who is going to, to make the economy? The population, the salaries, the pensions. And of course, we have to diminish the health services. We have to, to, de to dismantle all the welfare state, we have to dismantle all the public education, and we have to give space to the private investors in order to be more effective and to make economy. So the, the thieves are, are still producing an, another chapter in their uh, activities, which is now uh, bluntly to take the money from the people's pockets for the banks and for their own interests. So this is the idea, this is what is happening. And this is also the, the main cause of the crisis of the political system today. Because today, I mean, it was the same policies as I said before, but today it is, very, it is obvious. I mean, you don't have to be a communist to understand what is happening. So that is what is happening in Greece, that the majority of, of the population is, first of all, is a victim of these policies in their own pocket, in their own house, in their own, in the children at the school, and so on and so on. Uh, for example, as I, to as I told you, I'm in the health sector, uh, the out-of-pocket money for everyday use of public services, public health service, is increasing every day. I mean, you go to the public hospital, you have to pay. They started with a five euro entrance, just 
in order to enter, you know, the, the building, five euros. And then they are starting, uh, ah, you have to make an x-ray, you have to pay that, and you have to pay. So it is uh, out of pocket for the public services. I'm not speaking about the private sector, of course, which is uh, there you have to pay much more, of course. So all that, the Greek people is living under all this pressure, lowering uh, uh, salaries, uh, increasing, and this is very important, and it is a, a very crucial uh, point of the crisis, every day, these days that we are speaking, every day, uh, 1,400 persons are going to unemployment. Every day. 1,400 persons, every day. So you can understand that, what that means for a small country, of course. Greece is 11 million, okay? It's not, don't compare it with the US uh, population and, and, and uh, rates. So uh, that means that the people is understanding that something is going wrong. They understand that some, the, the, all the money that is coming, this is another issue, is coming through the, in order to pay this debt through the memorandum from the European Union. We know, and we have seen it already, it's not theory, that all this money is going back to the banks, to the banks who produced this crisis. So the, the money is not going to the, the Greek population, okay? So they are threatening us that uh, they are not going to give more, more money, but we know that this money is not going to go to the Greek population. So this is, we are ar arriving at the moment to understand the political crisis, which means that the majority of the Greek population uh, is not believing anymore the mainstream politicians. And this is very important to see what is happening, okay? So all the, first of all, the big parties, the conservatives, and especially the, the socialists, is destroyed. I mean, they had in 2009 44% of the population, of the, the votes, and uh, they, they went back down to 12. So, I mean, it is really, they are really dismantled as a party also, and they have internal quarrels, of course, as it's always happened in this uh, situation. The conservatives also are really di have difficulties in gathering their own party. So we have the crisis of the political personnel, as we say it. On the other side, and what this is the main issue, I think, for today's discussion, if you, if you agree with me. On the other side, we have a, an interesting phenomenon, a new coalition of the left, which is Syriza, which means the radical coalition of the left which uh, is an interesting story because it started not top to down, but down to top, which means that this coalition, in this coalition we have, and historically also it's very interesting to know, you probably are people from the left and you know that all the different fractions and currents that we have in the left. So what we have in Syriza is that we have all possible currents there. So you can have in the same table and we are in the same, we are comrades and we are discussing together and acting together even if you are a Trotskyist and you are a Stalinist and you are a Eurocommunist and you are a social democrat, left wing social democrat and so on. So this is a very important uh, uh, issue about this uh, coalition and uh, in order to understand it you have to know that this was produced as a grassroots movement during the European, the social forum era of the International Social Forum, you know that. So we had the European Social Forum and the Greek Social Forum, which was a grassroots movement uh, uh, against, <coughs> against austerity and against capitalism during the last uh, decade. So oh, Syriza came as a, a normal, let's call it, continuation of the European Social Movement uh, activities. Okay, so we have in Syriza all these uh, Oh, thank you. All these uh, fractions and, and currents. And the important uh, characteristic is that today we understand, we understood that we have to cooperate and we are really cooperating and uh, living apart our differences, which are there, of course, and we can discuss, but the, the difference is that today we can discuss them and not, uh, you know, fight each other. So, uh, Syriza being a grassroots movement, I mean, starting from being by a grassroots movement, uh, produced, was in all kind of mobilization of the Greek population of the last uh, five years. So all the, the Occupy, the Plazas, you know, movement, the I don't pay, uh, I disobey, and so on, all kind of movements that we had spe specified on the policies implemented in Greece, 
uh, people from Syriza were there without trying to, you know, to, to put the hat in the movement and say, this is our movement. No, the movement is a movement. But we are there with the movement, we, we are part of the movement. And this is, uh, respecting the movement, I think it's a very important issue also for a long, long, uh, long term strategy of the left. Not trying to, to put your hat in the movement, I mean. So, uh, uh, Syriza was uh, the only uh, political voice all this period being in the movement and having a strategy to overcome the crisis. So this gave this result, which is today we have, as it was said before, uh, we are, uh, the polls are showing that we have a 30% of the votes and it is the first party. So have, making a possibility, theoretically at least, uh, that uh, in the next uh, period, we could be also in the position of ha handling the government. <coughs> On the other side, uh, the other parties of the left, probably you know, the, the main party, another important party of the left is the Communist Party, which is a, a Communist Party coming from uh, the, the group of Communist parties uh, being the uh, so-called the pro-Soviet in the period where Soviet Union was existing, of course. And they, so they are characterized, I mean, uh, by a kind of sectarianism, you know, having roots from a kind of Stalinism and sectarianism, which is today, uh, we can see that. But w w what is important is that in the everyday movement, in specific Movements, for example, in the university, because we have a movement keeping, we want a public university. We have a movement for health as a social right. And, and in all these kind of movements, we are really near with all the comrades of the Communist Party in the grassroots level. But this is not recognized by the direction of the party. We say, no, we don't have any relations with anyone. We think that only our party is a revolution, all the others you are you know, dangerous uh, uh, social democrats or whatever. Anyway, this is, but the dynamic today is that in grassroots we have a coalition even with the comrades of the Communist Party and with the communist, uh, the comrades with Ander, of Andarcia, which is also a coalition of uh, extra-parliamentary, as we can tell them, uh, uh, groups of the left. And we have also good cooperation with them, even if we have, we have a lot of differences in the approach of the situation and the strategy for the situation. So, uh, what is our approach today? First of all, we think that uh, there is not, Greece is not the problem. Greece is just the weak part of the chain in the European uh, situation, but the problem is the neoliberal policies all over the world, of course, and in Europe which are really heading to an impasse. There is no solution about that. I mean, the, the, the growth rate is going to the majority of the European Union countries. It's going down or it is stable, okay? In Greece, of course, it's going very down, okay? Uh, and uh, the, crisis, the crisis is there. The main characteristics of these policies, and we have seen it in Greece, but not only in Greece, in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, and so on, and now it's coming to Germany also, it is that we have all these years an, a very a tremendous and aggressive offensive uh, of the capital against the labor. That is, which is so, it seems so simplistic, but I think this is the reality. That if you see what is happening is that there is no more labor, there, is, there are no more labor rights, okay? Hours, what means hour? What means eight hours? I mean, we had in Chicago the, the, the movement uh, hundreds, more than a hundred years ago about the eight hours work. That finished, there is no eight hours. There is no uh, uh, permanent job. Preca precarious, preca pre precariat, okay, the precarious job, and so on. So we have a tremendous offensive against labor. On the other side, of course, we have a tremendous gathering of wealth to the hands of a very small minority in Greece and in Europe. And so this is the problem. And the problem is not going to be solved, of course, only in Greece, because we are very often asked, what are you going to do in Greece? We ca I can answer, we cannot do anything in Greece if Europe is sleeping, okay? I mean, Greece could be the trigger, 
Greece, Greece the, the, the case of Greece could start a, a, a process of a, a domino process that is going to change all this neoliberal ideology actually and policy and is going to change Europe and perhaps the world I don't know this is the more optimistic approach of course <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway uh, Greece cannot stand up alone okay so Greece can start this struggle possibly because we have a better today a better uh, structure of the of uh, the equilibrium of forces I mean we have a strong left wing uh, current but Greece cannot do anything alone I mean it's uh, it's nonsense to go back to a nationalistic approach and so on and speaking about nationalistic I have to say that okay the positive and the optimistic uh, news are that the left is quite popular in Greece on the other side we have a, a very important and you know that very well and I know that you have done already quite important activities here on this issue I, I heard uh, we have a, a current of growing fascism okay and Nazism actually in Greece the, the, the this uh, group called Golden Dawn in this uh, Gallup, I was referring that we, we are the first party with 30%, they are the third party with 12%, which is really uh, uh, very uh, dangerous and uh, 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 something that we have to deal with. I mean, we don't have to just close our eyes and don't see that. I mean, we have to deal with the growing of fascism in a country uh, where, for example, because uh, probably you know that this uh, fascist group, neo-Nazi neo neo group, is uh, s centering their uh, uh, policies today against the immigrants in a country that all families, all of us, we have immigrants all over the world. You know that very well. And I can tell you that, uh, as being here, that me also as a Greek, I have family in the States, of course. Not in New York, but in Boston and so on and so on. So anyway, I mean that Greece as a, as a, a society, and it's not even recently, we have a, a very rich history of immigrants, Greeks being immigrants in several places. So this is producing another uh, mentality for the immigrants. I mean, we see the immigrants with much more understanding that they can be seen, for example, in the UK or in France, where they are the, the foreigners coming there. We are also the foreigners coming here and there and there. So even in, with this tradition, it is very dangerous to see today how this uh, fascist group is growing. And what we can see, and we analyze that, analyzing that phenomenon, is that uh, their characteristic is that they are speaking and acting anti-systemically. So in a system that is in a crisis, all the political system, as I was telling you in the beginning, is in a crisis. So all the politicians are really uh, uh, in uh, the population don't believe them anymore. So these guys are coming and with an anti-systemic anti approach and behavior mainly, they are showing to the people that, okay, you have to, we have to change, we have to break with that system, and here we are, we can give you the, our way. So it's a very difficult and important and dangerous situation that we have to deal with. And our approach is that, uh, and this is what uh, we are doing uh, the, the recent period, I mean, we have the, the decided uh, recently that uh, <clears throat> we have to organize uh, solidarity, we have to organize solidarity, and I'm going to speak about that. Solidarity between all the people. Uh, we have to organize ourselves. So self-organization, solidarity, and resistance. These are the three main issues that we are making for this period. And speaking about solidarity, this is a very important issue because, as I told you, a lot of people is going from being middle class or lower, uh, lower and and. and lower classes, uh, certainly they are going to real poverty through all this, uh, uh, the unemployment mainly, but also that having the unemployment, being in poverty, and having in the same time the dismantlement of any kind of welfare state, so uh, there is a lot of people that are going really in, in real terms in misery. So what we are saying, and we have a, as a motto, we are saying we have no one has to be left alone in the crisis. We have to be solidarity, to have solidarity. And that means uh, already we have an important movement 
in not only Syria, it's, it is a movement, uh, uh, grassroots movement, but of course we are pushing that movement also, uh, of solidarity, starting from, uh, for example, we have the solidarity cuisine, so every week, uh, depending to cities and to, to regions of cities, we are producing, we are uh, all together, we are making, we are saying that uh, this day we are going to, for example, here, and we are calling everyone who wants to, we are going to eat all together. So it's not a philanthropy. We are not philanthropists. We don't like that. We don't think we, we, everyone has to be rely on our philanthropists. No. We are making a movement of solidarity. So everyone has to bring something. You can bring your water. You can bring your, even your uh, spoon, you know. And I can bring perhaps a bit of food and so on. So we are producing this kind of movement, a grassroots movement of solidarity. And in our view, this is the most important uh, movement responding also to the fascist ideas. Because solidarity means solidarity to everyone, to the immigrants, to regardless of uh, nationality or of religion or, or whatever. So <coughs> this, uh, this movement is very important for us. We have also, for example, we are, we, we are organizing in a variety of cities and regions and even in the same city, in different districts, uh, social as we call them, uh, social health centers, which are health, health centers, literally, working with physicians and other health professionals, and uh, not only professionals, but also all other people that are helping us. And we are looking at the patients for free, of course. And not only that, but we are making campaigns, and we are asking for, from all the population, give us the, the drugs that you have on surplus in your house, you don't need them. So we have also a big response for that. Now we have big pharmacies, that we have a lot of drugs that were unused and just in the cupboards of the houses. So they, they brought us the drugs to us and we are giving the drugs for free to the people that need them. And this is very important, I, I repeat, as a solidarity, not as a philanthropy, because all these people are getting in this solidarity movement and every patient of us is also giving what he or she can do. For example, we, had a, we, we have a person who is making uh, uh, chairs, how you call them? Um, carpenter. carpenter, yes, exactly. A carpenter who had a, a problem with his blood pressure. And he said, OK, I'm going to make you more chairs for the, the health center because everything there is done by us. So you know, we are producing this all, all together. It's not the patient which is coming as a client, but it is a patient which is coming in a community, and all together we are building up solidarity. And uh, uh, ending with uh, that, I want just to, to make some comments about uh, how we are organized now, Syriza, because I look, Joan is looking at me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm afraid, yes, okay. <laughs> so. Uh, as I told you, Syriza is a coalition of uh, dif different groups, and now we decided uh, some uh, one month and, and more on that that okay, now we have seen that this coalition is going well. I mean, we are, we have the understanding between the different currents, so now we started. We decided to start uh, uh, the road to make a unique party. So what is happening these days? And actually, I heard that it happened here also, in New York. We are organizing the assemblies of people that are interested. It's an open, open procedure to the population. So we are making in districts, local districts, villages, and so on, open uh, assemblies to all the people that are interested in, in, in to be involved in the building up of Syriza as uh, un one party. So we are making these assemblies. These assemblies are discussing the political goals and the political, the, the ideology that we have and uh, are discussing or changing and so on and making their own comments. And then these are going to produce, to, to elect some representatives. And in the first and second of December, we are organizing a conference which is going to elect a new central committee, let's call it of the party, and this central committee is going to have as main goal to organize the big conference, the first conference founding the party in early spring. 
So the idea is that being in the movement, uh, we are going also to try to build the party within the movement. Here I have to tell you that, uh, I mean, uh, one strategy possibly of the system uh, against us is that as we have a lot of activities in the movement, uh, we say that they are going to kill us just by because we have to run around with several issues. You know, for example, I want to to stress that because it's something that is happening these days, is that we have a, a big, a big, a very important issue is that uh, an, a multinational company based in Canada, which is called El Dorado, just by chance. I mean, the name is very. <laughs> yeah, yeah? Uh, it's a mining company. And they want to make a big inve investment, they say, we say catastrophe, in northern Greece where they want to, you know, to dig for gold. And actually the, what is very important to know is that the, the concentration of gold in this here area is less than one gram per ton <laughs> of gold, you see. So in order to have one gram, they have to extract one ton. So you can understand what that would mean for the, the, the region there. And actually, the, the region is Halkiviki, perhaps you have heard, which is highly touristic. It's a beautiful region. And they're going to destroy that, of course. And so we have a big mass movement, grassroots movement from the locals there, but not, not only the locals, a lot of solidarity there. And we have really big struggles. Actually, we have uh, the news we, we, we were discussing today from Sunday is that we had a big rally in in the mountain because it's a, a, a very nice forest there which they started already cutting the forest and we had a big mass rally there and the police was really brutal and uh, I mean we had very a lot of people injured uh, the police working of course as the servant of this El Dorado which is not only in multinational I mean one of the biggest figures in Greece which is a big uh, businessman and controlling one of the biggest TV channels and newspaper is also involved in this interest. Bobol, as it's called the name, it's famous in Greece. Infamous, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, yes, we have this problem, for example, uh, this, this struggle to also to, to, to struggle with. And uh, I have, I mean, I was uh, just uh, before coming here, I was in a, in a village in a discussion like this about the gold mining because as you can understand what they are saying i mean the company and the government are saying look there are jobs here 500 jobs so in an era of uh, unemployment is you know it's a very difficult thing and we have actually some reactions by the lo some local population that say okay this is a job for us let us have this job i mean you know it's so they are really pushing on the needs of the population, the needs that are created by their own policies, of course. So, <clears throat> uh, yes, so this is the idea. I mean, uh, the, I think we have to discuss more, and uh, I think it's better to give to the floor, the, 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 you know, the possibilities to discuss and to come back to, to more issues uh, later if you, if you want some questions or if you want some comments uh, uh, later on. The idea for us is that, I mean, uh, we, we think that, uh, we feel that we have a big responsibilities today for the Greek population and not only the Greek, I repeat saying for the international movement, okay, we are in a crucial, in a very crucial uh, position. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that necessarily we are going, I mean, it's not an open road to be a government. Don't, don't be so optimistic. I mean, uh, uh, even today, I have to say that the Greek government, with the help, of course, of the European Union, uh, the majority of the laws they passed the last two years are against the Greek constitution. So, I mean, you know, we have, uh, we, we are going out of the, the democratic rules. I mean, the constitution is not, is not uh, respected by the government. So, I mean, we, 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 uh, possibly we could see a lot of uh, 
scenarios going on. So it's not only that we are going to be a government. It is a challenge, of course. It is a possibility. We have to struggle for that, and that's why we are struggling for that, of course. But we are aware of the dangers also that there are there. That's why we believe that it's very important to raise an international movement, not only of solidarity to Greece, which is one point, of course. It is very important. I mean, before the elections, the second elections, that there was a possibility that we are going to be, you know, that we are very very close to be a, uh, the first party in the, the elections, the last elections. So we are discussing, we had already prepared a call to the international community that if we were a government to, to have as a first step of solidarity to make a solidarity touristic movement, you know, during summer that a lot of people are coming as solidarity tourism in order to, to bring also money for uh, the new government, the new situation in Greece. So, I mean, this is one point, the solidarity movement, but it's not only that. I mean, it's not only solidarity to Greece. It is also a, a struggle in every country to overthrow this nonsense uh, neoliber neoliberalist ideology and policies. Yeah, thank you for your stimulating presentation. Um, yeah, I will briefly discuss about some of the issues that um, I was thinking about as you spoke, as well as the issues that, um, you know, as a, a sort of points that um, I would sort of um, add to what you had to say. So first of all, in terms of uh, movements of resistance, um, First of all, you have uh, the question of uh, the labor movement um, in Greece. And uh, there has been significant resistance, I would say, to these austerity policies. But of course, uh, the magnitude of the attack is such that it could be argued that um, this uh, resistance has not been uh, what it should be. And of course, uh, Greek labor unions are dominated by forces that are close to the Socialist Party or even the Conservative Party. And um, in this sense, um, you know, the labor movement, the leadership of the labor movement um, is to, has to some extent been uh, an obstacle to the kind of um, resistance that um, the situation is calling for. Although it's um, kind of interesting that um, more recently, you start to see tensions even within the wing of the labor movement that was historically affiliated with uh, the socialists. So that would be, I think, um, one of the things that I would be interested um, to hear more about, uh, because, of course, uh, the labor movement will be an important actor in determining uh, future outcomes. And um, I would also be interested to hear more about um, Syriza's relationship to the labor movement and um, Syriza, it's my understanding that Syriza has not been um, very strong historically within the labor movement, not as strong as the Communist Party, for, for example. And um, of course, the sectarianism of the Communist Party carries over to um, its uh, tactics in the labor movement, and that is also kind of an obstacle. Um, but um, now, when you think about um, uh, the resistance forces on the political side, um, you know, the rise of Syriza, I think, is a very hopeful development. But, um, and um, the, the, the sort of uh, slogan that uh, Syriza used that was successful and helped to, you know, increase its um, power very rapidly in the last few months was the idea that we need a government of the left to to deal with this uh, juggernaut of austerity that is leading nowhere. And I think people responded to that. But uh, one of the problems in recent months is that um, um, it has become, in some ways, it's uh, harder to see today what the partners for Syriza would be in, um, when it came to forming such a, such a government of the left, because the Communist Party is still resistant to this. Um, and the other party that was seen as a possible partner, the Democratic Left, uh, these are people that used to be part of, um, of the Syriza coalition. Now they have, you know, 
basically move to the other side. They used to, up to a few months ago, they would consistently vote against austerity, and now they are part of the austerity uh, coalition. So I think that's um, um, an important question, and um, I mean, one possible answer would be that perhaps Syriza manages to rise to 38 or 40 percent, and they can have enough deputies in the parliament in an election, but then as um, uh, you know, I was talking to Alexis earlier, and the point, of course, is that in order to make the kind of drastic changes that are necessary, it's not enough to just have a number of deputies in the parliament. You need to have a strong popular movement. And I think um, this is where a coalition with um, other left forces, the communists or even other um, forces of the extra parliamentary left, uh, would be very important because they would increase um, the kind of uh, the, the the power of the popular movement that would be necessary for any left government to be uh, effective and to be uh, successful. Now, Alexis also talked about the idea of Greece um, becoming a trigger that uh, uh, will change um, will change Europe. And um, here, I think um, one of the the problems I think that Syriza is facing is that um, it is not obviously an easy task to sort of say you're going to change Europe or to say that I'm going to be, I'm going to, you know, win the election and I'm going to talk to Miss Merkel and explain to her that neoliberal, the neoliberal model is not working, it's making the crisis worse, and I will convince them to change the, the policy. And this is, I think, one of the, uh, the issues that Syriza faced in the recent elections, because the other side, of course, would say, well, what if you don't convince them? What happens then? And, people will, and then that's when they start to play on the, sort of, um, the fear factor, because they cannot offer hope, so they, start, they say, well, they are going to stop giving you money, and you will instantly be thrown out of the euro, and you will, you know, not be able to finance uh, oil, to get, uh, you know, sort of um, medicine and so on and so forth. And the argument is, you know, you think things are bad now, way to see what would happen if this were to happen. And I think one of the things that Syriza really needs to confront is how do you give a kind of convincing answer uh, uh, to this, um, to this uh, kind of argument. And I think one answer would be basically to say that Greece does have a lot of bargaining power uh, when it comes to Europe. It has refused to use it. And to some extent, Syriza has been uh, sort of talking about it. But I think oftentimes you would see that people would say that they wouldn't want to sort of go out and say it 100%. Because then they would be accused as, oh, you're being too aggressive, you're going to antagonize the Europeans. The only way, you know, to sort of um, be effective with them is to try to, to reason with them and so on and so forth. You're crazy, you're sort of, um, and so on and so forth. And I think what the other side was saying was basically didn't make sense because they were saying that, you know, we are going to negotiate with them while promising to them that we are not going to do anything that will endanger their interests. And of course, as a negotiating strategy, that doesn't make any sense. So they, I think what I see as I follow the political debate in Greece, oftentimes I see the, the right making nonsense arguments, but they are very glib about it. And somehow they oftentimes manage to come out as if they are the realistic ones, when what they're saying is nonsense. So I think Syriza has to somehow find a way or, um, of um, improving the, the, the delivery so that um, the message that comes out can reassure people because there is a lot of uncertainty. And of course, people in Syriza will, uh, will admit there is a lot of uncertainty. Um, but um, of course, uncertainty creates uh, a lot of fear. And uh, fear can lead people to sort of very kind of conservative directions. It can, um, um, and this may be one of the uh, sort of uh, uh, factors that has led also to uh, the rise of reactionary forces uh, like uh, Golden Dawn. And the other thing that I would be interested in is to 
care more about the kind of Europe that Syriza would imagine? What would the Europe that Syriza wants look like? How would it be different? And this is something I haven't heard as much um, uh, about uh, in the debate um, uh, in Greece. And uh, one, of course, question there is um, one of the effects of, uh, of the crisis, of course, is to create new kinds of uh, tensions and divisions within, uh, within Europe. The whole sort of legitimating myth of the European Union is that it has brought the Europeans together. It used to be a war-torn continent, and now, you know, there is no war, and they got the Nobel Peace Prize and so on. But what, what has happened is that there has been a racialization of the South, and this has created, I think, lots of distrust and divisions between people in the North and the South. So how do you build, do you w go towards that ideal Europe while overcoming the distrust that may come from ordinary people in the North? It may be easier to imagine people in the South coming together than this kind of, this gap between the North and South being bridged in the immediate future. Okay, so I have a whole series of questions as well. Um, but just to kind of locate, the work I've been doing is in Latin America and with social movements in Latin America, and I think that's particularly useful um, in thinking about what's going on in Greece and with Syriza because of the rise of left political parties in Latin America, but also the massive social movements, and many of these movements are autonomous social movements, and so there's this real clash with the state. So with all respect, and I hope Syriza wins. I'm also going to ask some questions related to this. Um, and then, you know, I lived in Argentina, but actually I've spent also a lot of time in Venezuela and Bolivia, and I think the two provide kind of good frameworks for raising questions. So in Venezuela, and I'm sure most people know with Chavez, there is from the top um, a lot of support for autonomous organization from below, the consejos comunales, people organizing in neighborhoods and then getting funding from the state, but so as to develop the base and to develop broader and broader kind of neighborhood committees that then actually have more and more control, which now also includes self-managed workplaces. There aren't that many, there are a few, and there are laws that have been passed that allow workers to take control of their workplaces. Lots of tension with the state over this, and workers actually, and neighborhoods actually fighting the state sometimes to get more autonomy, but, but it's being supported from above, right? Um, and then in Bolivia, with MAS, there's a lot more tension. And so I was just there in August and in Cochabamba where there's been the water committees that have been organized autonomously, not just um, for the distribution of water, but also policing, all kinds of local autonomy um, in the communities. Well, now the government has decided that they're not efficient and is actually taking or proposing the taking of autonomy from the communities to fall under state control. So these are two different ways of looking at left states and what what could happen. So then to flip to Greece, and I think it's great, I mean this, not great, but the, the context and looking at the crisis as a, an economic crisis, but it's a political crisis, and I think throughout the world more and more that political crisis of, you know, in Spain, they don't, represent, they don't represent us. Sorry, I'm used to moving around a lot when I speak. Okay. Um, the, the, in Russia, they actually borrowed the slogan from Spain of the no nos representan and turned it into they don't represent us and they can't even imagine us. You know, the whole kind of push against representational politics, which, you know, enters Syriza into this crisis of, this political crisis and crisis of representation. There's already an issue. And then the formation in Greece, you know, which goes back, but especially over the last years, of more and more autonomous organizing. So <clears throat> with the crisis in healthcare, so many neighborhood assemblies have been organizing to block the cashiers in the hospitals. So what Alexis was describing, the, the assemblies go and they block the cashiers so it's not up to the neighbors and the people who live there to pay. They've used direct action to make it so they don't pay. Or with electricity, a large percentage of people are refusing to pay the tax that's on the electric bill. Um, some people are having their electricity turned off and then neighbors organize to re connect it. Um, or the Solidarity Clinic. I got to go there in um, June, in Thessaloniki, which I think is fabulous. Um, but again, and, this, and I'm going to raise questions with all of these, but even with the pharmaceuticals, if Syriza's in power, and there are pharmaceuticals being distributed in a clinic, there's this question of regulation. And will the pharmaceuticals internationally, 
allow for the regulation. And the same thing with imagining being an institutional power, what do you do when workers took over a factory in Thessaloniki? Really exciting and inspiring. What is the role then of the state with workers who are taking private property from bosses or with electricity? It's a tax that perhaps the state needs and would use for good, different than how it's being used. So, so how do you relate to that autonomy? And then the last question um, would be with Golden Dawn and how, you know, on the street, so many of the assemblies and people are organizing autonomously to fight Golden Dawn, physically. I mean, stopping fascism when they go and attack immigrants to beat them back. Um, and this raises questions with a criminal code. If you are in institutional power, you know, what do you do as far as groups of people, you know, what would seem like beating each other? Is it okay that autonomous groups are beating fascists so they don't beat immigrants? And so just to kind of, and then looping that back maybe to kind of the different models that we can learn from, I think, of left governments that have come into power. How do you see, or what are the discussions like within Syriza about the vision of what kind of state this could look like? So um, I had the pleasure of meeting Alexis uh, about a year ago at the, uh, in Turkey, at Ankara, at the meeting of the International Association for Health Policy in Europe. And there were a couple of things I took away from that meeting. First was that the mayor of the town came and greeted us all. And I'm just waiting for the day when the uh, Mayor Bloomberg's going to come and uh, introduce the radical film series. Uh, the second one was that the conference, I don't know if you remember this, started off with a violin recital. And I would also wait for the day that I would go to like a talk at PNHP and then we'd start off with a violin recital, which I thought was very nice. And the third one was that, um, you know, this was a conference given by the Turkish Medical Association and there was translation available. So I basically learned two things. One was that every lecture by the Turkish Medical Association started off with a reference to Karl Marx. <laughs> which, I must say, I've never been to a medical conference where his name has ever been mentioned. And the second one was that after hearing Karl Marx's name, even though it was translated to English, there was nothing else intelligible about the entire translation. Um, which was kind of distressing to me because when I got up and I gave my talk, at one point I asked people in the audience to raise their hand if they understood what I was saying. <laughs> and nobody raised their hand. <laughs> um, so, um, well, I had a chance at that conference to actually interview two of the doctors that works with Alexi, Stathis and Elias, who told me, Elias, who told me a little bit about what was going on in the healthcare system in Greece. The fact that in 2011 there had been a 40% cut in the public health budget. Um, that they, as doctors, their normal salary was about 3,000 uh, euros a, a month, and they were now getting 2,500 or less euros a month. Um, about the massive uh, cuts that have been made in personnel, they spoke specifically about um, the drug programs, because um, there was an increasing problem of uh, drug abuse as the economy was tanking. And there was sort of a subtext on this, which was as the public sector was being cut, people were supposed to go to the private sector. And there was this sort of stealth privatization that was taking place even within the public sector. You had to pay five euros to get an appointment. And if you wanted to be seen by a specialist before four months, you had to pay 70 euros. So even within the public system, there was privatization going on. And there were large multinational corporations moving in to, to uh, try to capture this, the private market. And they said that even though Greece had the largest uh, out of pocket, out private, private spending on health of any country in Europe, that was supposed to increase under the command of the Troika. And this is a story that's very familiar to me. Now, I edited a journal called Social Medicine. We publish in English and Spanish. And we get articles about privatization going on, and it's the same story everywhere in the world. In fact, earlier this year, we published a paper about Syria. Now, you know, we hear a lot about Syria, but it's in fact the case that the European Union 
was actively promoting the privatization of the public health care system in Syria, and that this has probably played at least some of the role in the distress with the regime, a story that we never hear about in the United States. Um, we can go north to Quebec, which is a country we like to point to as doing a better job than we are, but uh, we published an article also about Quebec and the way in which um, the doctors there were organizing to defend their Medicare system because the government had decided that it was smarter to privatize uh, parts of the health care system um, the, in Quebec. And what they typically do is they take high volume procedures like cataracts and they carve those out and they give them to a private company that's now making a lot of profit um, and in fact they can pay better salaries so doctors are being siphoned off from the public system. This is going on over and over again in countries around the world. It's certainly going on in a number of countries in Latin America. Um, and I think what's interesting to me is, of course, this process is also going on here in the United States. Um, you know, we have a pretty good Medicare system that covers, every, covers everybody who's over 65 here. But beginning with the Clinton administration, we saw the creation of the for-profit HMOs to siphon off the well seniors and make a lot of money off of them and leave the sick seniors in the public system. When um, George Bush was president, baby George, um, he decided to, give, to fill in one of the big inadequacies of the Medicare system and he privatized that by, by which is the pharmaceutical benefit. And rather than doing the logical thing, which was to have the government buy the pharmaceuticals, he parceled that out to a whole series of, uh, of uh, private companies which created a total nightmare for everybody. I, I, as a clinician, I can tell you that. Um, and in our latest round of health care reform, again, President Obama didn't do the logical thing, which would have been to put caps on what the pharmaceutical industry could make. In fact, as we know, he just told pharma they could have what they wanted. Um, and if the new president is a Republican, his vice presidential candidate, as we know, has talked about um, turning Medicare into a voucher program, which would, of course would be wildly unpopular and would probably be the reason for us to have a crisis here that would justify at least some, give some ideological cover to make people frightened so that they would agree to such a program. So, one of the things that strikes me is that even though we see the same policies being implemented all over the world, almost, it's almost like a textbook that they just open up, um, we as activists who are against this seem to be so totally divided. Um, and even the organizations that we belong to, which are organizations of international activists, seem kind of weak in terms of our own organizational capacity to respond to those. Those are some of the thoughts I had as I was listening to your talk. Thank you. There is, as, as yet, not fully elaborated um, idea for a demonstration on November 14th that's going to be held in conjunction with purported general strikes in Greece, <coughs> Spain, Portugal, Portugal and France um, that day. And we're, so there come the Greek activists here and the people concerned with this issue are thinking of doing that and perhaps also reaching out to Portuguese, Spanish, French people who are here for some kind of common activity. So we don't have the details yet, but uh, stay tuned. What is what we are saying to the IMF? We are saying that we are not recognizing this debt. We are, we are saying that we have to control and to make an audit about what is that debt? What is about that? So we are certain, we know that, if we do this audit, which no, no one is permitting that internationally, not only in Greece, uh, we can see very easily that we have this flow of wealth from the pockets of all the population to the pockets of certain persons and certain interest, interests. So this is a debt. So that it, there is a debt, of course, but the debt is the, that uh, someone has stolen wealth for their own interests in the expense of the society. So this, the society now is called to pay these debts. For example, and this it is very well known, even recently now, I mean these days, uh, the, 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 the loan that is coming is going, and it was already announced that it is going to the banks, the banks that produce the problem, okay? So we have to see that. And this is 
altogether changing the way that we are thinking, okay? And not only us, but everyone. And the, then I'm going to, to this question about, okay, are you going to persuade Merkel? Of course not. We are going to force Merkel, and actually, not to force only. I mean, the idea is not to, to change the, 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 the mind of Merkel, but just to overthrow Merkel. I mean, I can give you an example, a symbolic example, that you know that last week Merkel was there in Athens in order to, to help the Greek government, which was really, <laughs> you know, it was really a show, a very theatrical show that Merkel is coming in Greece and she was uh, greeting and saying how well the prime minister and the government is doing in the Greek policies. So what we have done, and symbolically I think it says a lot, is that we make a big manifestation against Merkel's presentation there, what, which was leaded by our leader, Alexis Tsipras, and the German leader of the left, Die Linke. So in this way we are showing and we are replying that the problem is not between Germans and Greeks. It's not a national, a national issue between North, South, Germans, Greeks, and so on. It is between uh, the, the people that is working or not working, the unemployed, of course, and capital, capital interests. So it is between greed and between needs. And this, there, with this way, I'm going to the other uh, answer that how we respond. As you said, everything is changing. Yes, exactly. So we are not. We don't want to go back. And this is very, a very crucial issue to discuss, I think. I mean, for example, let's say my field <laughs> and Matt's also. We don't want to make, I mean, we know very well that the welfare state, which was built in Europe at least, okay, from the Second World War up to, to now, it is a very bureaucratic, yes, it is bureaucratic. It is not effective, yes, it is ineffective. It is corrupted, yes, it is corrupted. It is hierarchical and so on and so on and so on. And it's spending much more that, than needed, of course. So we don't want to go back. We are not defending a, a, a mechanism that is not working. And we want to go back to the welfare state. No, we are going to make a new, a new approach. And this approach, I mean, of course, we don't have any, every solution to everything now written. I mean, it would be uh, at least uh, nonsense to have it, I mean, if not uh, arrogant, you know, to have all the solutions there. But uh, what we, we, we can say is that uh, uh, the way of thinking and acting has to change. And in this way, we are going to find work, uh, uh, jobs and so on, in the target. Today, the target is the profit, is the greed, okay? And we are replying to that. In, instead of greed, we are going to put the needs. The needs of the population. So the needs of the population, for example, are health care. Okay, so we need some jobs in health care. The needs of the population are education. So we need some jobs in the education. The needs of the population in social care. So we need some jobs in social care and so on. So we are going to shift every, the way we are thinking and acting, uh, having in front of us the needs. So we have to, you know, to clarify what the needs are and how we are going to respond in that. If we do that, okay, we go to another society which is replying to the needs by, and in this way, you are going to produce new jobs that we cannot even imagine today in these fields of the needs, replying of the needs of the population. <coughs> so, uh, as far as the European uh, perspective, uh, I want also to say that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the idea is, uh, as I, I said already anyway, that the idea is to, 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 to promote a European movement overthrowing the neoliberal policies and the politicians that produce that and are playing these roles. I mean, and th this is obvious. And uh, of course, this is not uh, uh, so clear today to see that. I mean, the, the situation in all over Europe is not so optimistic, but here, we have to say, I mean, this is what we are living, but in theory also, we know very well that in critical points and moments of history, okay, the political time is very condensed, so we cannot predict what is going to happen, and we cannot speak and, you know, and say, okay, Europe is in a very bad, yes, it's in a very bad position today, but we hope that we are going to have a big movement, uh, not uh, acting Greece as acting as the example, but okay, Greece was the first victim of that and is in front in this way. 
So about uh, uh, the, the dilemmas about uh, the euro and uh, the, the European, uh, co the construction of the euro in the, in the European Union, uh, I think we, we are quite clear. I mean, we are not saying, I mean, if, first of all, we, we have to clarify that if you say that Greece has to go out of the euro, is uh, uh, quite a populist approach, but is saying nothing because what what that means, okay? And then Greece is going to go to the old currency, drachma, okay? And that means in a few moments, all the the, the international uh, fiscal system and uh, stock exchange and so on is going to 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 make the drachma every every moment the devolution is going to be enormous and then everyone can come in the country and buy everything in just a few minutes okay and so it's nonsense on the other side of course we are not saying that we we, we want that it's the opposite we are saying that the crisis not only in greece in all europe is 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 a result of the architecture of the european union of the architecture of europe of the neoliberal exactly policy so we have to overthrow that of course so we have to change Europe. Yes, we have to change Europe. This is our, our, our approach. It's, it's not a national approach. It's a European approach. And of course, it is a European approach that is saying that, and I'm going to more, uh, what Europe uh, do, someone asked, uh, what Europe are we thinking? Uh, of course, uh, it's obvious that we are saying that instead, in the place of the Europe of profit and of capital, we are going to make the Europe of the needs of the population and the Europe of socialism. That is clear also for us. I mean, it's, it, there is no other our alternative today. Today we are living in the impasse of the neoliberal capitalist policies. Here it is. We have, I mean, there are no solutions because if there were solutions, they were already were thrown in the reality. There are no solutions. The greed is greed. Some people are getting richer and richer, and the majority is going to the misery and to the and the society is leading to the barbarism. So the only answer is the only alternative is to speak about socialism. And speaking about socialism, uh, with the more concrete, for example, examples, for example, and uh, as it was said about, for example, the drugs. Of course, we are speaking already, we are preparing in our program, I mean, we are speaking about the need of controlling, the first of all, the drug market. So we are speaking about a, a national market, con controlling the national market of drugs. And secondly, and very importantly so, to organize better and, and to enhance the national uh, industry of ph pharmaceutical industry. In, in Greece, we have, and this is also an interesting uh, contradiction, let's say, of the system. The only national industry, you know, the, the only place we have a production of quite nice na uh, drugs in uh, Greek production is the army. Because of the army, you know, perspective that the army has to be independent and if we need, uh, if, if, if we are in a war, the army has to have already their own stock. The army, so the, the army is producing their own drugs so this we can we can see that as a first step for example to make a, a national I I industry of drugs and speaking about health also today as I, I told you we have a big crisis of health services the, the the public health services are dismantled on the other side the private health services are good jobs good businesses still today so the first solution about that i mean we have big need of the population there is we cannot reply with, with the existing public services because they are dismantled, but we have good, at least in terms of uh, uh, buildings and infrastructure, we, we have good uh, clinics and so on, private clinics. So the first step would be just to nationalize these clinics. I mean, it's obvious. We have the needs, we have, there is that, and we have also, if we make the audit of the debt of these clinics, we can see that they are working mainly on uh, the, the back of the public sector. I mean, the public sector is paying them through the public uh, insurance schemes, is paying all the, the, the private sector in Greece. So we have all the, all the arguments also to say, okay, we are going to, of course, to nationalize this, uh, uh, the, 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 the private sector in, 
in health. Speaking about the autonomy of uh, the uh, movement, I mean, this is very important. I agree with your points and what we have, we see all over the world and all the Latin American exams are very important. Uh, as I said before, the, for me, the optimistic uh, characteristic of Syriza, which can be bureaucratized, as we know from the past, I mean, all uh, in, in several movements that went to, into power, the first big danger is after, after of course, the opponent, is the bureaucratization and the uh, inside corruption and so on of, of the movement. So uh, for me, the, the, the first optimistic approach that I can answer to that is, beside our program that we are speaking about that, is that exactly Syriza is coming from is, is, is a result of a grassroots movement. So we have all the, you know, the culture of the grassroots movement. We, we respect the grassroots movement and we are working within that. So we are not outside. So of, of course, we can, I cannot guarantee now what we are going to do exactly, but at, at least our roots, okay, the roots of that movement is that we respect and we are working in the movement. So we respect the democracy in the movement and we respect the all the dynamics of the movement uh, against the central power. So I think that, uh, I mean, okay, this is an optimistic point. I cannot guarantee that, as I said, of course. Um, okay. What else? I think. Labor. Yes? Golden Labor. Dawn and how versus Labor. Labor? Labor movement. Ah, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, very important. As it was said by Costas, and uh, it's, uh, he's correct, uh, fully correct, is that the, the unions, I mean in Greece, all the unions and the federations are ruled and, uh, through a majority, especially from the Socialist Party, and uh, to, uh, secondly, from the Conservatives. So the left-wing forces, all the forces together, and the Communist Party and us and anyone, are the minority. Between them, of course, the biggest part of the Labour Party is uh, in uh, the, the Communist Party is involved. I mean, in the unions. I mean, so we have an important part of the Communist Party, and we have the majority by the Socialist and Conservative forces. And Syriza, yes, we don't have a tradition in that. But now, I mean, the last two years, we have a raising movement uh, uh, under the under the title the. The union, not the union, the coalition of uh, union activists of Syriza, which is growing. Now, what is happening, of course, also in the union movement is that uh, we have the, this crisis of representation, as we said before, it's there also. So we have the, the direction of the movement of the unions are still in the hands of the bureaucracy of socialists and conservatives, but the majority of the members and the unionists are, first of all, critical to their uh, representatives. I'm not saying that they are with us, I say critical to their. So the, the representation uh, dynamics are uh, in, a, in an unstable uh, situation today. And there we are working, of course. We have already a lot of people, a lot of uh, trade unionists that are uh, coming to our uh, not the, the party, but to our uh, bigger working occupation of people, uh, no, okay, working movement coalitions. Okay, so they are coming with us, but this is something that we have we have to work, of course, a lot. And uh, we are speaking again, and that is another issue which is was not mentioned, but it is interesting that we are speaking a bit again about the grassroots movement of the workers. Okay, because we have some. Uh, some of the trade unionists that were really involved in the previous era in the uh, corruption policies, okay, of the corruption of the labor movement by the socialist and the conservative governments, they are trying now to, to come and clear it within Syriza, you know, to say, okay, I'm Syriza, so I'm a new, a new person and forget my old past. And that is a critical issue. I mean, we are discussing a lot of that and we are resisting. Especially, I mean, we have also a decision about that. Someone who was, as a name, who was known already 
uh, uh, playing uh, an ambiguous role for the, the, the labor movement is not permitted to get within our ranks. We're concerned about, in a day-to-day -day way, are there things that more than is being done mm -hmm. to protect? Mm -hmm. Yes, you're right, you're right. So, for example, there are some regions in Athens, okay, that you could see that something is happening there. For example, there is a, a, a square, I guess, but the name is called uh, that. Uh, it was a, a playground for children, okay. And they went there, the fascists, and they throw away the children of immigrants, you know. And uh, then we went there, of course, and we had in front of us people that were claiming to be local citizens of the, the district there, and say, yes, we don't need these children. Uh, these people, I mean, all the images. So I mean that we started to react a bit late. So we, we, we let them, you know, make their first uh, steps. Now, today, it's obvious. I mean, for example, last week, uh, a few days, three or four days ago, we had in Thessaloniki, uh, the, the fascists said that they are going to make a manifestation. And immediately, the anti-fascists uh, un I mean, uh, front, which is all of us, I mean, it's not only Syriza, we said, okay, no, we are going to make also, so, you know, in, in the way, in trying to stop them, to stop any presence of them, so this is, an, we are chasing them actually now. What about when the immigrants are actually being, I don't know if the press is too much on this, but I mean, we're, it, it looks, who, who's, who is there to defend them? From what I read in the paper, it's uh, young anarchists go out. Yes, them. yes, 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 yes. So what does Syriza think? And what does it do? No, it's, it's obvious for us, of course, that we are defending. I mean, we are in the movement of uh, anti-racist, and uh, it's obvious. I mean, the only th I, I'm telling you, I can uh, accept, we accept that we, we are late in reacting, but today it's obvious, I mean, that we are defending, of course, and we are going together and so on. And we, it, the idea is to prevent even their presence. For example, a month ago, they said that they are going to make a they organized actually, and this is a big issue between medic, medicals and uh, uh, our profession, they, they organized the blood donation day with the service of blood donation of the hospital. So it was a colleague of us that accepted that. You know, so we made really a mess about that. We went against it to our colleagues and we have now also uh, legal in the, in the order of uh, the medical association. I mean, we have <coughs> quarrel now illegally against our colleagues there w because they accepted to go that under the motto that we are collecting Greek blood only for Greeks, you know, which is a nonsense also. It's not, you know, it's a nonsense scientifically, of course, it's, uh, but it, it is a nonsense of fascism, you know. So we oppose that, you know, and we make a big mess and at the end it was a, a very, very big, uh, uh, the, uh, how you call the uh, not success, the opposite. <laughs> huh? Failure. Failure, yes. All European socialists, unfortunately, proved that uh, they didn't have any, ideologically, first of all, and political reaction to neoliberalism. All, all of them. I mean, if you see Germans, French, Spanish, Greeks, Italians, and actually they were Politically, the, all the socialist parties in Europe, they were the parties that uh, enhanced much more the conservatives than the neoliberal policies because they had the good relationship with the labor movement that we were discussing before. So there are no changes. I mean, for, today in France, uh, we don't have... A, I mean, the socialist uh, and the president is not uh, quite different from the president of Germany and the policies of Germany. I mean, we don't have, unfortunately, any differences. In my view, and this is a big question, of course, and it's another discussion that we can make uh, for days and days, I think that the, not only European, but anyway, well, I am Eurocentric because I'm there. Uh, the example of Europe, the, social, the socialists in Europe during the neoliberal era is showing the, the end of social democracy, which is an historical issue. I mean, starting from the second uh, international and ending with neoliberalism. I mean, it is the graveyard of, I think neoliberalism is the graveyard of social democracy because it has proven th there was no any answer, any possible answer to neoliberalism because neoliberalism wants, has to be overthrown, not 
just managed. It's unmanageable in another perspective than the profit, I mean. Um, so now speaking about the immigrants, very good point. Yes, of course. I, and probably you know the, the treaty, the European Treaty of Dublin II, is, it's called, which exactly is not permitting the countries. I mean, every immigrant cannot move from the country is, he or she is entering. Okay? So in this way, the immigrants are really hostages okay, of, the Europe, of this European Treaty. They have, they have, unless they go back to the war and they are going to be killed to the countries that they are chased of, from, uh, they don't have other opportunities but to stay in Greece, for example, or in Italy or whatever. So, of course, this is a big issue and we are speaking about that and we are saying that we are going to contest the, this treaty of Dublin too. Because what is happening today, the state in Greece, I mean, there are all these immigrants that are coming, they call them illegal immigrants. We say that no human is illegal. This is our standing for. So, they are, but they are illegal in their views because they they don't give them papers. I mean, the state that is not giving them papers, they, it's calling them illegal. I mean, it's a, it's a nonsense. So, of course, we have to we have to to give them. First of all, there are a lot of people that need seek asylum, political asylum, because they are chased by their countries there. So, there, of course, we have to give them quickly asylum. Okay, and then help the other people, so give them papers to go to wherever they want to go. You ask them to close them. Yeah. Okay. We're not okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>